Hi, it's Stephanie Chang. Thank you very much to the Women's Center of Southeastern Michigan for this honor and for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. And most importantly, thank you for providing the critical support to women and families throughout this region through counseling, supporting moms and babies, financial coaching, job coaching, divorce support, and providing a space for Black women to support one another. You are doing such important work during such an important time. As women, it is our time to continue standing up. And as Justice Ginsburg says, speak your mind even if your voice shakes. So tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my own background, uh, the way women mentors have impact, impacted me, and talk about how we can together make the world a better place for women and girls. I am the daughter of Taiwanese American immigrants who came to this country looking for a better opportunity. And I'm a mom of two young daughters, two and six, and they are my little motivators uh, to keep going and fight for their future every day at the Capitol and in the community. Uh, my mom uh, is an amazing woman. Uh, she, uh, you know, I think a lot about the fact that both my parents really made a sacrifice to come to a country where they literally knew no one else uh, and start a, start a future here. Um, and so I, I'm eternally grateful to my own mom, who I have come to appreciate even more in her role uh, helping with my two young daughters. Uh, she is their ama, which is Taiwanese for grandma. And uh, she is truly uh, someone who's made a huge impact on my life, um, someone that has always encouraged me, someone who has always shared uh, with me and instilled in me the values that I fight for every day. So I grew up in Canton uh, and went to the public schools there, graduated, went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And when I was there, that's really when I became a, an organizer working on issues affecting students of color on campus. Uh, my freshman year in college was the year that the, the Supreme Court cases around affirmative action uh, were taking place. And so got really involved in the efforts to try to preserve affirmative action at the university. And also when I was at Michigan, I met Grace Lee Boggs. Uh, some of you may know who she was. She lived to the age of 100 in Detroit, and she uh, was a legendary activist, writer, organizer, philosopher, and she really did shape a lot of my experience in Detroit, um, because after I graduated from Michigan, I moved to Detroit and lived at the Boggs Center, uh, one floor above her, and helped her out um, you know, with just various things throughout, throughout the day. And she was always asking us, how can we create the beloved community? Always asking us, what time is it on the clock of the world? Always giving us assignments to think about or write about. Um, and I really do think that living at the Bog Center has shaped a lot of my experience as a Detroiter, as an organizer. I think I would probably be a much, be a much different person, a much different Detroiter, uh, if I had lived somewhere else when I first moved to Detroit in 2005. So, you know, I worked as an organizer on everything from affirmative action to indigent defense reform, co-founded Asian American civic engagement groups um, to make sure that Asian Americans are participating in our democracy and advocating for comprehensive immigration reform and voting rights and much more. And when I was in grad school, getting my social work and public policy degrees, I was approached by my then state representative and good friend Rashida Tlaib about running for office. And so Rashida is the third woman who I'll mention as someone who has made a, a huge impact on my life. Um, she you know, really mentored me and as someone who I had actually worked, we both knew each other before either of us you know, was in the political world. We were both organizers turned public servants. And um, you know, I remember the first couple times that she asked me to consider running for her seat as she was entering her last term in the Michigan State House. The first few times she talked to me about it, I literally thought she was joking. I did not think that she was serious, but through um, lots of conversations with her, through shadowing her at the Capitol, being able to ask her questions, ultimately I realized it was an amazing opportunity. And so she has always been there to support me, and I'm so grateful for all of that. Um, in my time in the legislature, I've worked on a whole host of issues, um, but tonight I'll just mention a few women and girls issues that I uh, I'm so proud to have worked on everything from female genital mutilation to a bipartisan sexual assault package to addressing domestic violence issues 
we have a bipartisan set of bills regarding misdemeanor domestic violence and keeping guns out of the hands of the abuser that we're uh, in reintroducing very soon. And also a lot of work around sexual harassment at the Capitol through a bipartisan work group. But I want to talk about what's happening with women and girls, this pandemic and our future. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected all of us in numerous ways and women and families were certainly impacted, whether you were working from home with your children on Zoom meetings or making the tough, tough choice of whether you could go into work in person or, or not uh, due to the nature of your job or take leave or quit, all complicated by whether or not you had childcare options available to you that were open and that were affordable. Those of you uh, like me who had children in remote learning all of the last school year, kudos to all of us. Not totally sure how we did it. Uh, I know that for my family, it wouldn't have been possible without the support of someone providing care on most days um, that we had the financial means to pay that we know not everyone did. As far as women in the workplace, Deloitte issued a report this summer called Women at Work, a uh, global outlook, and they surveyed 5,000 women across 10 countries and nearly 80% of women say that their workloads have increased because of the pandemic, and 66% of women report having more responsibilities at home. <coughs> LGBT women and women of color have experienced even greater challenges, and over 4 million women left the workplace during the pandemic in our country for numerous reasons. So how do we move forward? Clearly, we need to address a number of issues here. Child care, the pay gap, and even how our school system works, for example, whether or not aftercare is readily available. And for those who have stayed in the workforce, many women have said they've experienced non-inclusive behaviors. The Deloitte survey found that women experience everything from unwanted physical contact, disparaging remarks, or questions about their judgment. Child care. First of all, those who care for our children deserve to be paid fairly and have good working conditions. Too many face low wages, not enough benefits, and not enough opportunities. Yet we know that we wouldn't be able to do what we do without them, and our economy would not survive without child care providers. Second, we all know that high quality child care can be very expensive, and not everyone can afford it. We need to ensure that more families can have access to the Great Start Readiness Program and expand eligibility for child care assistance so that everyone can have access. Women's health. We all know that women's rights are under attack. When Texas passed the strictest abortion law in the country by banning abortion after six weeks, creating an environment for witch hunts of anyone who may have helped someone access an abortion without any exceptions for rape or incest, many of us watched and reacted in horror. Ask people with irregular periods and they will tell you at six weeks, you might not know if you've missed your period because you're pregnant or if it's just a late period. Ask people who would not be alive today if they didn't have an abortion at six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, they would tell you they would make the same choice again. They might even tell you that the children they have would not have been born if not for making that hard choice previously. Michigan, we have an antiquated law on our books from 1931 that prohibits abortion. And if Roe v. Wade is overturned and if we don't act swiftly to protect these rights, we will unfortunately uh, go back to 1931 when we had no protections at all. And so I'm really proud to be part of a package of bills led by Senator Geis, also along with Senator Winnie Brinks and Rosemary Bayer. So I, I truly believe that there are many reasons why a person may choose to have an abortion uh, and that decision should be between them and their doctor. Uh, this is critical to women and our families, and we need to continue to stand up for women's reproductive freedom. Gender violence. This is a huge issue that we have to continue to do work on. One in nine girls under the age of 18 experience sexual abuse or assault at the hands of an adult. And so the bipartisan bills that I've been so proud to be part of for a number of years now and helped lead these efforts uh, would make a big difference in preventing some future mis sexual misconduct from happening. The bills would take critical steps to ensure mandatory reporters are properly trained, prohibit professionals from discouraging victims from reporting, and change laws governing health professionals so they can't commit sexual abuse under the guise of medical treatment. My bill in particular would take important steps to ensure that all students with, that are in grades 6 to 12 receive educational materials about sexual assault and harassment and inform young people about available resources in their community. 
four years ago, actually at this point, uh, six years ago, I started a fellowship for high school girls of color in my district. And in both 2016 and 17, the young women chose to work on sexual assault and interpersonal violence for their community action project, because many of them who have either experienced sexual assault themselves or have a family member who is a survivor spoke up and said this is a priority. So the fellows decided that they wanted to conduct a survey of their peers, and they found that a large majority of their students, fellow students, knew someone who was a victim, and most said they had never been educated in school about these issues. So I worked with them on this legislation to make sure that all students receive instruction about sexual assault and where to turn for resources in the community. It is really, really important that girls and boys and every child learn about sexual misconduct and where to turn for help. And this education cannot wait until college. We know that young people experience assault at alarming rates and we need to make sure that they have the information and resources that they need. I wanna close by talking about women running for office. When I first launched my campaign in November, 2013 for state representative, I said that I would start a fellowship program for high school girls of color in my district. And so now in 2021, we have had six successful cohorts of young women who have had leadership training, workshops on community organizing and understanding oppression and social justice issues, and who developed community action projects on sexual assault mental health in schools, food justice, period equity. And these young women are powerhouses. It's been amazing to see them grow and continue to demonstrate their leadership. And I truly hope to see some of them one day run for office soon, soon. Kamala Harris, as we all know, made history in 2020 when she was elected to become our vice president, the first woman, the first black and South Asian person to serve in this role. Truly, truly amazing and inspiring. And women have unquestionably been making gains across this country in terms of holding elected office. 143 women in Congress, 2,286 women in state legislatures. And right here in Michigan, we have gender parity in our state Senate Democratic Caucus with eight women and eight men, and more women than men in the Michigan House Democratic Caucus. But we have more work to do and it is critical to have women's voices, mom's voices, women of color's voices on school boards, city councils, trustee boards, and in every position where decisions are being made. So if you are here, you're listening, and if you've been asked once or twice to think about running for office, please consider this one more time. I hope that you'll consider running for office. When I think about my two young daughters, I know that their generation deserves a future that is better than what we have now. These girls deserve a world where great opportunities are available to all people, where personal health decisions are respected, where we can have fairness in our pay and how we are treated in the workplace, and where they can live safely without fear that they will be the victim of harassment, assault, or abuse. They deserve the best. So here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, may we raise them, and may we elect them. Thank you so much again and have a great evening.